Hey, hey, welcome to Film Fanatics. We are three film geeks discussing movies new and old. My name is Dan. My name is Justin. And I'm Joe. New releases that we'll be reviewing this week include a couple of 80s remakes, About Last Night and Robocop. Our triple feature of older films is Jack Black starring in Bernie, Joe's pick for old classic Sideways, and a very old Oscar nominee, 1938's Algiers. Our top five this week, inspired by Bernie, is our favorite Jack Black films. Let's jump right in and get to our first new release, and that is About Last Night. This is an urban remake of the 1986 Demi Moore Rob Lowe romantic comedy that was Edward Zwick's directorial debut, the man that would go on to direct, among many others, Glory and Blood Diamond. Now, this version, starring Michael Ely, Regina Hall, Joy Bryant, and even though he plays a supporting role, gets top billing on the poster because of his massive popularity, Kevin Hart, and is directed by a man with much more of a comedy pedigree than Zwick, Steve Pink, who also directed things like Accepted and Hot Tub Time Machine. This is based on the David Mamet play from the 70s, Sexual Perversity in Chicago. The movie sees two couples through a year of ups and downs and breakups, at the beginning of the film, Bernie, played by Hart, introduces his best friend Danny, played by Ely, to the girl he just started hooking up with, named Joan, played by Regina Hall, and her best friend and roommate, Debbie, played by Bryant from TV's Parenthood. The two hit it off and fall in love, as Bernie and Joan's quote-unquote relationship is falling apart at the seams. Ely has said in interviews that he didn't watch the original film to give an unbiased perspective to his character, and I think he did a great job with it. Ely is a very likable actor, and even though he is 40, he certainly doesn't look it and was able to play the 28-year-old Danny with ease. Joe was surprised by that. He's 40? I didn't know that either. I thought he was like 25. Does, doesn't he look great? <laughs> definitely had me fooled. Yeah. Whoa. He, he definitely <laughs> fit right in with the rest of the cast. Kevin Hart replaces one of my least favorite actors, Jim Belushi, who played Bernie in the original, so I was happy to see that because I do like Hart. He's starting to wear on me a little bit, though, since this is his third film in less than two months, but the dynamic between Bernie and Danny is still very likable, even when the characters themselves might not be. Regina Hall does a good job with a not very likable character, though Bryant was merely serviceable. The biggest problem by far that I had with About Last Night is its directing. David Mamet is one of the trickiest playwrights to adapt because of the quick pace of his dialogue and the characters constantly interrupting each other. It's sort of like watching an Aaron Sorkin show. Steve Pink doesn't seem to understand, though, that you don't need to switch back and forth and show every single character every time they talk. It very much hurt the overall resonance of the comedy and the story as a whole. The script, though, is just as sharp as the original, and the updated ending fit well with both present day and the more urban take of the characters. Because of the frenetic directing, though, the best I can give about last night is a B. Now, Joe, you're the one of us that has not seen the original, mm -hmm. so I'd like to hear your take uh, <clears throat> next on About Last Night. I wish I had seen it before so I could draw a comparison. Maybe you can let me borrow it so I can give, uh, yeah, me, I would love to. give my thoughts about it. So I went into this fairly unbiased. I honestly didn't know what to expect based on the trailers. I thought it looked, you know, moderately entertaining. Going in, it, it seemed like a pretty standard comedy romance film, but... I think the thing I really liked about it was the fact that it actually tackled some believable issues from moving relationships from serious steps. And if that is close to the original source material, yeah, then I, ha I have to give it props to the writing of the play because I thought it, it was very believable, these situations. Mm -hmm. I also liked all the characters and I felt the acting held up from all the main ones. I actually thought Regina Hall did an okay job. And I, yeah, I, I guess I it's like well. a semi-serious role for her. You know, In terms of like comedies, it's like probably the most... Uh, real than i've seen her play yeah i mean i know that she still does some outrageous things but it's bordering on more serious yeah they're all sort of down to earth characters so when I, it comes to it so yeah. i thought they they all fit in pretty well I, I mean kevin hart was still kevin hart but yeah i mean I, he kind of intersected well however if this was a comedy i don't feel i laughed as much as i should have okay uh, there were some good lines in the movie, which I liked. I thought the dialogue was pretty sharp, and I did giggle a few times, but I, I didn't like, you know, find myself rolling on the, the aisles laughing. Mm -hmm. uh, there were also some side plots, such as the connection that the main character had to the bar and his father, and uh, getting a new job. 
which I thought was interesting, but uh, kind of underdeveloped. And I, I wish we could have spent... Yeah, I actually really liked that part. Like, I thought, a little bit. I thought that was probably the best element of his story, and I, since he's the main character, mm-hmm. like, the story for his development. It was good, but it felt like we really could have spent a lot more time working Especially on in the that. second half, once they sort of got he gets, a business uh, relationship when together. When he begins bartending mm-hmm. and, and kind of taking more active role in that part of his life and leaving his job. And that's a huge step in how it affects his relationships. So... If we had gotten a little more into the details about that, that would have definitely helped it. But despite that element, that was like my biggest problem with it. Mm -hmm. I felt that it was a decent film. And even though I didn't find it that funny, it was relatively entertaining for me. And I think that in certain crowds, it would definitely hold up better. And that's why I would give it a B-. minus. Okay. Yeah, I I think that the the main plot of the film between Ely's character and Julie Bryant, Mm -hmm. they were sort of the more serious of the two. And then, of course, Kevin Hart and Regina Hall were like the wild. They were like the comic relief of the film. It's basically, I can can see what you're saying. Like the straight man-woman couple versus the comic relief couple. Right. And I got that. Yeah. And I, I guess I liked the fact that there is kind of a sort of a reversal that occurs in the movie that I thought was kind of clever. Mm -hmm. I thought that made the side characters seem more believable. And I thought this was interesting, the way it was marketed because it's a Kevin Hart film. I remember Justin saying that you thought that he was going to be the main character of the movie. Which I, surprised I thought me. that. that like, yeah, Justin actually knew. I, I was the one who thought that he was the main one. Oh, you did? Yeah, Justin knew that he was playing the Jim Belushi role. I didn't think he was based on the, the trailers. Really? Yeah. Okay, I knew. Well, and he gets top billing on the poster. Well, but it's true. So I just I sort of thought he was the Rob Lowe Vert oh, character. I just think that's interesting that I wonder how many people had that misconception yeah. because I didn't think that myself, but going in, I, I did find it interesting. He was really just kind of on the side of thinking, mm-hmm. I don't know why he, I know he gets top billing because he's so popular, but he really, I think that kind of takes away from the main actor's credibility. I do too. Michael Ely is a very likable actor. Uh, he was probably my favorite part of Think Like a Man. I know that you've mentioned him before. I've he's, never seen him in anything. Well, he's currently on the TV show, is it called Being Human? Or Almost Human or something? Almost Human. Almost Human. human. I just started on Fox. It's supposed to be very good. I heard an advertisement about that. It seems like it would be right up your alley, too. But, yeah, I I honestly think that in terms of performances, his was my favorite. Mm -hmm. I thought he did a good job. Mine as well. I thought he did a really good job. I didn't think that he was going to leave that much of an impression on me, but I did enjoy it. Justin, what did you think of About Last Night? Now, you didn't like the original quite as much as I did. I gave the original an A-. minus. As I believe you mentioned, uh, (laughs) when it comes to comedies, take my my grade (laughs) And up, up it in a full letter, and that and there you and have it. Yes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> kind of what I did, to be honest, because I, I, like I said, I thought it worked well as a film, but as a comedy, might not have hit Maybe all the right notes so for much. me. But I, I heard other people laughing. And I'm like, you know, if this is working for some people, I'll give mm-hmm. it some credit. Much like the film source material, the best thing in regards to about last night comes from its incredibly likable, albeit flawed characters. Admittedly, much like the original, it occasionally falls prey to melodrama, but for the most part, it keeps the story lively and interesting. Well, the two films differ is that in this version, director Steve Pink places a greater comedic emphasis on the overall narrative. That's not to say there, are, there aren't serious moments in the new version, but they aren't quite as common as in the original. This is not necessarily a bad thing, and I would happily call it my favorite Kevin Hart performance, even though, as you both have mentioned, it's, it's still Kevin Hart playing Kevin Hart. That said, About Last Night stands as one of the better date movies of recent years, despite said flaws mentioned and particularly on Valentine's Day, which is usually one of the worst periods of time for me to review movies, and I give it a very surprising B-. Oh, okay. yeah. So you liked it as much as the original. I was I was pleasantly surprised. I was not. I was actually expecting this to get a really low grade, given the fact that I felt like they were just trying to take a strange, urbanized take on the material, and they weren't going to respect it at all. Yeah, but the thing is, About Last Night is not a well-known movie. I mean... I never heard of it. Joe never heard of it. I had only heard of it myself maybe five or six years ago. And probably that same for myself, yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not like... I mean, obviously we're going to discuss RoboCop here in a few minutes. It's quite a different thing to take a movie that is well-received but not that well-known and remake it as opposed to RoboCop, which is obviously hugely loved by pretty much everyone. And they're also going for a completely different audience when you look at it like that. You know, they're they got Kevin Hart in it. That, you know, it's it's a black cast. They they're going for an urban audience. You know, whereas RoboCop is going for the exact same audience that saw and liked the original. Mm. 
One thing you did bring up that I thought was interesting was uh, the, the mention of um, Steve Pink's uh, usage of these jump cuts. Mm-hmm. I did notice that, albeit in so many romantic comedies, I've sort of gotten desensitized to it. So I This seemed far worse to me, and I think it's because, you know, obviously David Mamet, like I said, dialogue interspersed and this character talking and then seconds later it goes to the other character uh, and it just steve pink didn't really have any shots that were just wide angle shots of the two people talking it was always either head on or side on for the one character talking or some variation of like we focus on this couple then we focus on that couple and bouncing between the right two. right right that's a very basic common directing mistake yeah, yeah. like has he directed many films because that's something that normally like a first time filmmaker will do it's a very well, like simple... i said most of most of the things he's done have been in the comedy realm mm-hmm. and i think you know when you look at something let's say like hot tub time machine <laughs> script wise compared to a david mamet work <laughs> it's a little bit Less uh, highbrow, <laughs> highbrow, sophisticated. I was gonna say laborious. Hey, I like that movie. I, yeah. I like no, that movie. No, no, no. well, I'm not knocking it. It's... I gave Hot Tub Time Machine a B. I'm just saying <laughs> that from a directing standpoint, mm-hmm. the, the script is not as frenetic. It doesn't it's not call as for fast it. paced. I don't know if this is in the original script. I want to ask you guys. There was one little thing I actually did like, and it was the transition from the seasons. It was like little sketches. That is, was is that, that was actually, actually that in, was pretty cool, and that was independent to uh, to the original. Okay, yeah, that Which was not in the uh, seemed like an eighties thing to me for some reason. <laughs> but I'll, I'll be honest, I really did like that. I don't cool. usually enjoy that kind of thing. I think it's I think it's choppy, but the way they handled it, my only real issue with that mm-hmm. and it is a really really small one is i kind of wish it was spread out a little bit more like the final chapter is not really so much of a chapter as it is an epilogue true and it it wasn't bad it was just like i wanted more with this yeah i did like the way that that was though that was cool i yeah i'm glad you brought that up i actually assumed that was something from the original they were just no. going to sync up so mm-hmm. that's cool a little originality there yeah other than the changed ending in the original, there's like a softball game. It just mm. it wouldn't fit with this cast. No. It could be a basketball um, game. <laughs> it could have been a basketball <laughs> game, although they did that in Think Like a Man. Oh. Um, and, of course, half the stars in this movie were also in Think Like a Man. So. We and can't I'm, tell the same story. <laughs> apparently, also, Think Like a Man 2 is coming out, which also has yes, a lot of the summer. same cast. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's correct, yeah. All right, well, uh, we've talked about it a little bit. Let's uh, move now into the other 80s remake we're going to be reviewing this week, RoboCop. And Joe is going to tell us about that. Uh, I tried to keep this relatively short. I think I failed. (laughs) Um, Robocop, a 2014 remake of the 1987 classic sci-fi action film directed by Jose Padilla. Forgive me if I mispronounce that. His movie basically follows the original film's basic plot. It follows Alex Murphy, who is a good cop in a bad town, who is on the case to track down a crime boss in charge of weapons dealing. However, after visiting his partner in the hospital, Alex is critically injured in a car bomb planted by the crooks he's after and some corrupt police officers. I'd say this is a spoiler, but it's obvious they're on the take from their first scene. Meanwhile, America has basically taken over the world and polices every country with the use of war robots. However, a bill will not be passed to allow the use of robot policemen on American soil. The head of Omnicorp Company, played by Michael Keaton, suggests a new project to make it easier for the public to accept. So he assigns his top scientist, played by Gary Oldman, to find the perfect disabled police officer and turn him into a cyborg cop. They obviously find Murphy, and his family decides to allow the procedure to go forward. The majority of this film is Murphy trying to come to terms with his new life and eventually becoming Robocop, taking down the criminals who killed him, dealing with his estranged family, and taking down Omnicorp as well. I don't really know where to start, and chances are we'll probably go on a way long, probably will go on way too long and reduce this to a fanboy rant. I will (laughs) attempt not to. The film is admittedly trying to say some intelligent things and bring some big ideas to the table in the vein of the original. Some of the action scenes are passable, and Michael Keaton is a decent bad guy. That's where the positive part of my review ends. I think the biggest problems with this film is that it doesn't know what it wants to be or what its main message is. It doesn't clearly identify who we are supposed to root for or against, or why, very clearly. And it really seems to suck out any of the joy or fun from the original film. There are a few references to the original film, but they are so obviously tacked on in an obligatory fashion that they come off as weak and insulting. The villains in this film are unmemorable and honestly stupid based on their actions. 
The characters are all underdeveloped, and we spend very little time with any of them. In the scenes where we do, there really isn't much going on. Frankly, for an action movie, it's pretty boring. The film seems to be more about the company than Robocop. The acting is honestly pretty bad from just about every actor. That doesn't help with the bland script, unwilling to take any chances, and with dialogue that's just not that good or believable, I can understand it. I do think Samuel L. Jackson was trying to do something with the news segments, though they become more tiresome and confusing each time they come up. I do feel that Kinnaman does kind of come into the role and the movie does decide to sort of follow through with the direction and kind of feels a little bit like Robocop for a while. However, this doesn't happen until an hour and six minutes into the movie. <laughs> if you want a generic action movie to waste your time, you might like this film. However, it failed as a remake, and it didn't hold up as its own film. The original is a masterpiece which balances social commentary with a gritty tone, great music and effects, a smart and occasionally funny script with a very strong human story. Robocop 2014 did not validate its own existence in the slightest, at least not for myself, and I doubt any real Robocop fan. I give this movie an F. Wow. Joe, that was the angriest I think you've been on this show. I'm kind of scared. I'm like scooting over now. <laughs> well, you are a huge fan of the original. I am. And it's, so it's completely uh, understandable. Now, for this one, I was actually the newbie here. Uh, like you hadn't seen about last night. Well, you still haven't seen it. Um, I had not seen RoboCop, the original, until the night before. I saw the new one. Uh, thanks to, to you guys for that. Normally, I like to watch the remake first if I never saw the original and then check out the original so that after the fact, uh, I can give the newer version a fresh outlook. Um, but since we did uh, check out RoboCop beforehand, I mean, it you said it. It is an action masterpiece. It's so good. And I have to imagine, if I never saw the original version, I might have been inclined to give the 2014 version a slightly higher grade, but I doubt it would have been enough to push it into the positive. There are definitely seeds of good ideas here. And I didn't lose interest in Detective Murphy's plight, but putting aside for just a minute that it's an incredibly pointless remake, and that the original still holds up, has a much better story, acting, action sequences, humor, everything, not one character in this remake made an intelligent decision the whole movie. <laughs> Every time somebody spoke and made a decision, it was like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that in the real world? It's a bad script. It's, it's just a bad script. Robocop himself, Detective Murphy, had, you know, he did a few all right things. I agree that the actor was kind of lifeless, but um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, I did think Samuel L. Jackson's Bill O'Reilly type was sort of a nice hook to get the story moving, but it falls apart fairly quickly after that. I will admit, like you said, uh, Michael Keaton also gives... A decent performance, but I just I didn't care much for how the movie showcases the family aspect of Murphy. Uh, the humor of the original is largely absent, and I'm one that tends really not to care about what rating a studio goes for as long as the intended audience is served. But to dull the action for a PG-13 rating just serves as an example of how little the filmmakers cared to serve fans of the original RoboCop. At points over the last few years, many big names were attached to this project, including director Darren Aronofsky and actors Michael Fassbender and Russell Crowe. It's hard to say how their takes on the material would have been, but this version is without a doubt the RoboCop movie that nobody asked for. I give it a D+. Justin? All right. Director Jose Padilla, I hope I uh, pronounced that right, alongside Joe on this one, uh, who made the foreign action or elite squad, has proven that he knows how to make a film gritty and brutal, but not necessarily entertaining. This is a necessary component if anyone is to make a legitimate remake of the 80s cult classic. While RoboCop is and has always been escapist entertainment, there's a small attempt at trying to create a sort of satirical commentary on the media. In the original, this marries itself well to the overall narrative, but in the remake, it just feels pretentious and underdeveloped. The action is still decent and the visuals have a good, albeit wholly unnecessary, updating. However, the worst aspect of the overall film stems from the acting. While the original is well known for over-the-top dialogue, but still retaining somewhat of a charm, particularly from lead actor Peter Weller, the remake has a surprisingly good amount of actors in the film, and none of whom bring any form of likability to the overall end product. 
The prime offender of this is, unlike, unlike you two mentioned, Samuel L. Jackson as Pat Novak. Every time he's on screen, the film feels less like an action film and more or less of a farce towards the overall source material. Robocop may still have a place in the 21st century for cinema, but this was just a mixed bag, and I give it a C-. minus. Well, I'd like to clarify that, though, about Samuel L. Jackson. I just was saying that the hook in the first scene with him was an interesting way to get into the story. I, I do agree with Joe that the more he came into it, the more sort of confuddled it all the, got. Two or three times it was fine. By the sixth time, I was like, why is this happening? Yeah. It's like, I, I get where they're going with that, and I think there are ways that they could have brought it together. Like, I believe before we actually started this show, Joe was making fun of how it opens up with him warming up. <laughs> it was just a goofy and obnoxious scene. And there were yeah, ways, it was. It exactly. Takes, but yeah. they could have, like, put that, like, midway through the movie to be like, okay, this is this is his, like, on-screen presence. And this is him. Mm-hmm. This is him as this, like, flawed guy not able to project that same image that we see him on, on TV. Well, I think here's the problem with that. Studios are trying to get super cute now with the different logos that they have. That's true. You know, we've seen it recently in, like, Wreck-It Ralph. You had the 8-bit Mickey, you know, driving the wheel of the Steamboat Willie ship. And here what they did was they had Samuel L. Jackson do his warm-up exercises instead of the lion roaring with MGM. Oh, yeah. And and I think, you know... To go cutesy in RoboCop doesn't make any sense. The guys Not that I was all. with were you like, know? what is happening? <laughs> you do cutesy for animated movies. You know, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs did something similar, and I think Despicable Me 2 might have as well. But to do it here, it just seems, it, it opens up the door to like, okay, what is this movie we're going to see? Yeah, I, I was completely lost on that. Well, I, I think a lot of it comes back to what I mentioned in the About Last Night review that it's serving a different audience than the original this was supposed to serve the robocop fans Mm. and like joe said as soon as it was rated pg-13 the fanboys were like well this is not going to be any good well and i mean admittedly there might have been a general feeling of this consensus before the film came out but everyone i know that loves robocop felt offended by this movie Mm -hmm. so if the goal was to appease those people they're probably the ones that are the most distance from it at this point. I think most people that probably like this movie probably know nothing about RoboCop. Mm-hmm. I, I, I couldn't would def- agree more. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. All right, moving on, we have Monuments Men. And uh, already after two weeks in theaters, this is the highest grossing George Clooney directed film, a group which includes strong candidates Whoa. like The Ides of March and Good Night and Good Luck. Clooney here heads up a truly all-star cast featuring Matt Damon, Bill Murray, John Goodman, and Cate Blanchett. The Monuments Men is set in 1943 during World War II and centers around a group of men given the task of locating and saving pieces of art and other items before Hitler can destroy them. Clooney plays Frank Stokes, who convinces the president that the Allies' victory over the war will have little meaning if an entire civilization's art and artifacts are lost in the process. So he's given authorization to assemble a unit made up of seven men, people like museum curators and art historians, not soldiers. Blanchett plays Claire Simone, a French curator who had been overseeing the theft of art by the Nazis and becomes an invaluable help to the team. Though based on factual events, the characters are just loose translations of the real men involved. Monuments Men was pushed back from Oscar season to February and hasn't been getting great reviews, but I have to say I rather enjoyed it. Now, it wouldn't have a chance at this year's award ceremonies or anything, but I thought it was a fair telling of a very interesting story. Its biggest problem by far is its pacing. It tries to hit home the importance of saving the art also, and does that best when members of their own crew are in peril, but it doesn't quite make the case for what it means for the rest of the war quite as compelling. And it's also never fully explained what motivates any of these people, Mm. other than perhaps Clooney's character, to risk their lives. But other than that, I did think it was funny when it needed to be, uh, specifically in the scenes between Bill Murray and Bob Balaban, but I enjoyed some of the other uh, repartee as well. Clooney and Damon, of course, have great chemistry, which we've seen before. And I also thought the scenes between Damon and Blanchett, who probably gives the best performance in the film, I'd agree. were very strong. It's far from the greatest film we've seen about the war, but I do think it's worth a watch, and I give Monuments Men a B. 
You like Kate Blanchett's character as well, Joe? I think that was probably the strongest performance in the movie. I, I agree. I thought Goodman's was also very good. Goodman was funny as always. Yeah. Justin, what do you think of The Monuments Men? The Monuments Men has the misfortune of having a great concept handled in the safest, most in-between-the-lines way humanly possible. George Clooney has shown his directing talent in films in the past, such as Good Night and Good Luck, so why he decided to play his film out like a mediocre 50s war film is beyond me. The acting's fair and the look is great, but from the cheap plays to comedy, to the heists themselves playing out like a rejected plot device from an Indiana Jones movie, accompanied by an obnoxious score, dramatically hurts the film. Character development often falls by the wayside, and as such, all emotional moments in the film are completely wasted. The Monuments Men is by no means an awful film, but with a concept this good, it deserves so much better, and I give it a C. Joe, what do you think? I kind of agree with both what you said. It had a great cast, and I think that the concept for the story is one that really needed to be told, because it's one I had never heard of before. It really did interest me. From a historical perspective, I kind of like that stuff. It also did hold my interest for the most part, and had some satisfying character moments, held up mostly by good performances all around from the great cast, as Dan mentioned. However, the story doesn't feel like it establishes all of its characters very well, and it seems so nostalgic and cutesy at points that the plot doesn't hold as much weight as I think it could. It does seem to overcompensate at points, I think, with the score as being overly sentimental, kind of what Justin was going for. However, I think that it's mostly intentional. It is kind of safe, but ultimately it's just an okay movie that I thought, with a little more, could have been great. As it stands, though, it's all right. I give it a C+. Plus. Okay, right, right in between there. Yeah, right down the middle. I think that um, the the look and the feel of the movie, and you hit on this, Joe, of sort of like that classic, you know, war picture mm-hmm. kind of thing. I I think it actually served the movie well. Maybe not in 2014, mm-hmm. but like if this were a movie we were watching for you know Oscar A to Z, and it was in the you know, 60s or the 70s, I think it really, really would have worked. I think it was kind of an homage to movies like The Greatest I, I agree. Kind of like a war movie, but a little lighter flair to it. Yeah, which... Certainly fluffier. I was, I was fluffy, gonna, a lot of fluff. Yeah. Way too fluffy. I agree and, with that. And the thing that's strange about it is there were movies in that period that were great because they handled the material very maturely. Like, The Great Escape, mm-hmm. we always think is a sort of, like, classic action blockbuster that has all these kind of mem- memorable moments and... But, I mean, it had some dark stuff in it, too. Mm-hmm. The difference being The Great Escape had about, I think it was close to three hours to <laughs> actually like establish that. it. And The Money of Sun was, I think, a little under two. Mm-hmm. Even within that, they were just able to pull it off so well. And I don't understand why George Clooney just felt like he had to do it in this kind of, like, safe between the lines, freedom fries kind of way. Well, I think that's because, as I said, it's... A little overly nostalgic and sentimental, but that's kind of the point. I think it is kind of a throwback to that idea. Maybe, yeah. that, maybe not just the content of what the film's about, but also that style of filmmaking, because Clooney probably grew up watching those movies. More than likely, I, I don't think that's a legitimate excuse to do it. It's understandable, I think. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I mean, it's maybe not that different from any other quote-unquote passion project. You know, if this is something, you know, and I don't know if well, this is the case, but if Clooney and Grant Hesloff, you know, feel strongly, like Joe said, they grew up on these movies, they wanted to sort of do an homage to that, I don't think there's well, necessarily anything wrong with that on the surface. You can kind of tell that it, it was sort of put together quickly because the plot is, it's there, mm-hmm. but it's kind of just there. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, I've got all these friends that are great actors, want to get together and make this fun little movie about World War II. Mm-hmm. Like, people were having fun. But I don't think anybody was taking it quite that seriously. Which is fine for Ocean's Eleven, but it's not okay for a World War II movie. Not necessarily. I mean, there yeah, are different ways you can, can tell be. the story. I mean, it doesn't always have to be the same gritty Saving Private Ryan stuff. Certainly, Glorious Bastards had some fun with World War II. There you go. The man does know how to have fun, even in Burn After Reading, his character. You know, obviously. Oh he, yeah. He can have fun. So no, I, I, I don't have issues with him having fun. I have issues with him having this awesome concept that should be Oscar worthy. It should be, and it's played out like this. Like I mentioned, Freedom Fries, God Bless America, uh, mediocre I, 50 sport. I, I, I guess film. my point though would be, you know, every movie about World War II doesn't have to be Oscar worthy. It can be a little bit lighter. It can be sort of a comedy, Mm -hmm. and this was. Now, obviously, uh, you know, I cited the problems I had with it. I don't think it's perfect, but 
I do think that they just were trying to have fun with it a little bit, and there's certainly some comedic elements. Did I want to see more of the story? Yes. I think if they just taken more time to establish those characters and maybe worked on the pacing, it would have gotten a higher grade for me. Mm-hmm. But I was moderately entertained by it. I thought it was okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't bored. It just, I, I just wish they had actually done something with it to give some sort of emotional appeal. I'm, you know, there were some emotional moments, though. They allude to the Holocaust in kind of subtle ways that I, I thought was actually kind of clever. That, I mean, that, yeah, that's pun- true. They, it wasn't the main focus of the movie, but they still acknowledged it. That, that could have easily been cut out. But unfortunately, all those scenes fall terribly, terribly flat. I don't know. I think they're acknowledged and they're let go the way they were supposed to be. They're acknowledged, but you don't get anything out of it. You, if anything, I got something out of it. If anything, it's kind of underwhelming. I thought you they, see a bucket full of teeth. You know, I mean, that wasn't underwhelming. That was pretty bad. Yeah, you know, I mean, and and I I thought spoilers, that the, it happened in World War Two. The sorry. letter to uh, no. the one gentleman's father. I thought that was pretty emotional. That's, and when uh, oh, and actually, the uh, I saw it with my girlfriend, and she actually uh, cried when I believe it was Bill Murray's family sang to him. Mm-hmm. Like so, I mean, there was some emotional yeah, on stuff the record for that some. They sang. Did they, they sent him? They sang him "Happy Yourself a little, Merry Little Christmas" or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that was which that was a good scene, you know. Which was good, but it also sort of comes out of nowhere. Not really. I, yeah, I don't know it's, that it did. It's probably the closest thing the movie actually has to a to a legitimately good emotional moment that that appeals to the to the actual audience. Well, okay. How about the subtle little things like between Bill Murray and uh, Bob Balladan? Bob Balladan. When they're like conversing about the little struggles that you go through when you're in combat, like not being able to get something decent to eat and then they get some some crackers and they're just enjoying that. I mean, that was subtle but that, I thought poignant. That was an interesting moment. However, their entire bit was arguably the most frustrating for me. Why? Largely because Bill Murray in this movie just is essentially a pun machine. Which is why I thought the Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas bit sort of fell flat. It's like, yes, it's nice his, his family did this, and it, it's sweet, but we don't really believe the fact that Bill Murray is anything but this, like, let's crack a one-liner every five seconds. I think a lot of people in wartime have a front that they put on, mm-hmm. and... Uh, you know, Bill Murray's was the funny guy, I guess. We'll co- the, cope in our it doesn't own way. Mean, yeah, it doesn't mean that he didn't have But feelings. there's a difference between being a front and essentially being a glorified comic relief character. He's Bill and Murray. And I would argue it was the latter. I think I think they slotted him in this movie for that role for that specific purpose, though, because he's Which Bill I'm Murray. Which I'm not okay with. Well, John Goodman was kind of the same. Yeah, I, I mean, was saying. John Goodman was sort of the same, but we did actually get a little bit more out of him. The problem is we, don't, we didn't get enough of him. And then we didn't really get enough get... of anybody, to be honest. No, that was that was another big thing that I have issues with. All right, well, I mean, we all had some problems with it, but like it to I, I, I think it's certainly worth a watch. If uh, you, especially if you're interested in, if you like art yeah. or World War II or just you're kind of in the mood for that, you have a lot of love for history. You'll probably like the movie a little more than the average person going in. But this movie was marketed as a bit more of a a thriller action movie, I think, with some comedy mixed in. And it's it's not quite as accurate as it was marketed, though. So just that I would agree with. Go in, yeah. go in with a, a different perspective, and you might enjoy it more. All right. Well, up next is our home media moment, and this week we tackle Fruitvale Station, and Justin's going to tell us about that. Oscar Grant III, played by Michael B. Jordan, is a young man struggling to start a new in the new year and get away from his past. However, when he gets recognized at a rapid transit station, chaos and tragedy ensues. My synopsis may sound like a spoiler, but I promise it's not. Fruitvale Station shows us said tragic event and then gives the audience a look into the day leading up to that moment. The result is a hard-hitting and very realistic film largely thanks to the raw camera techniques, allowing the audience to quite literally feel like they're a part of the story, and a very powerful performance from Jordan. While the film may feel as if it's manipulating one to be a bit more sympathetic towards Grant, whether or not he may be saint-like despite his uh, past habits as a potential drug dealer, Nothing feels out of the realm of possibility, and it's largely thanks to a great job from the supporting cast, which are minimal but still offer very compelling performances, largely Octavia Spencer as Grant's mother. Fruitvale Station is a film bound to leave many misty-eyed and angered, but it's a great film and more than worthy of a look for those willing to give it a shot, and I stand by my original grade as an A. All right, and one that uh, we'll probably hear in our uh, Oscar show our special that uh we're going to be doing next week sort of a mini-sode as it were we're going to be revisiting our uh, top 20s for the year 
and we'll have a special guest uh, for the show as well, listener Tim joining us uh, as a, a new contributing member of the program. Uh, every year, we typically get one super well-written, well-acted race message movie. Maybe two if we're lucky. In 2013, we hit the mother load with 12 Years a Slave, Mandela Long Walk to Freedom, The Butler, and this indie gem. It's a star-making film for Lee Jordan, and as we discussed during our Oscar snubs top five a few weeks ago, the best actor category this year is pretty stacked. But in a lighter year, there's no doubt that Jordan's name would have been right up there with the DiCaprios and the Bales. First-time director Ryan Coogler really paints a full picture of Oscar Grant, and even though he's got a lot of problems in his personal life, as Justin mentioned, it's clear he is really trying to turn his life around and make better choices for himself. Jordan's portrayal of him is so strong and honest, and Octavia Spencer from The Help gives another fantastic performance here as his constantly worrying mother. The only problem I really have with the movie is that I wish it didn't show its hand immediately. I, for one, was not familiar with this real-life story at all and would have liked to see it played out without knowing everything ahead of time. As Justin mentioned, not a spoiler at all. You see in the first scene what happens then at the end of the movie. At 85 minutes, I think it's also in need of some extra exposition about Oscar, maybe actually show him making a mistake or two amidst trying to get his life together. These are very minor issues, though, and the movie still scores a very enthusiastic A for me. And I will point this out before we go to Joe. Coogler is attached to direct the upcoming Apollo Creed movie, and Michael B. Jordan is playing the lead. So it will be a great way to continue their professional relationship because obviously Coogler knows how to get the best out of Jordan. So that will be interesting. I believe that's set for release in 2015. Joe, what did you think of Fruitvale Station? Now, you had not seen this previously, so this wasn't included in your top 20 list for the best of 2013. I saw bits of it, but I never saw the whole thing, no. Um, well, I kind of am going to echo what you guys said. The most notable element from Fruitvale Station was the standout performance from Michael B. Jordan and the very gritty realism of the life of a young man doing his best to improve his life. There is some honest commentary on struggling social classes and simple bad luck. The fact that this film is based on real events is what makes it even more tragic. It really does pull at the heartstrings, and I can understand why it's so well beloved, especially by my podcast members here. Still, I do feel that some possibly fictitious elements seem like they could have been less obvious at points, such as the dialogue and some scenes I think honestly trying a little bit too hard to be overly dramatic. Still, it was excellently directed and paced, with the protagonist you really wanted to see succeed, though unfortunately he does not. I highly recommend this movie, and it gets an A. Nice. So possibly uh, joining your top 20 well, it, it's uh, for most, the year. Most likely. Yeah. Very rare that we all three give a movie an A. Mm-hmm. It's, it's only happened probably a few <laughs> times so far. If, if I, I didn't, would say so, With yeah. new releases, if yeah. I, I didn't feel like some scenes were a little bit on the nose. I, I, like Just seeming like they were trying to manipulate you a little bit, as Justin mentioned. I was like, if it hadn't been for that, it probably would have gotten an A+. Plus. But I thought it was trying a little too hard at some Well, points. and it was certainly... Trying to portray him as this heroic person, but he did have flaws. He was and I a wish, human being. Yeah, he was a human <laughs> being. I wish they had sort of showed a, a couple a of those of flaws, like I said, mm-hmm. rather than just alluding to, you know, yeah, he just got fired from his job. Yeah, he was a drug dealer. I'm like, okay. Okay, but now he's trying to get on the right path, you know, okay, but that's this fine. Is like, it's like it's all hearsay, though. But right, right, you know, right. We don't see anything actually go down. I would have loved to have seen at least one scene of, mm-hmm. instead of opening the movie how they do, show him getting fired from his job or something. Or, and to be or, fair, you know. because it was a real-life event and there were probably a lot of people heavily passionate about the sure. movie, they were probably try- they're going to try and make this guy seem to be, like, the best person ever. And he probably was a good guy. I mean, I, mm-hmm. you know, if the movie is as true as it is, which it probably is, but like I said, you can tell that it was trying a little too hard at some points. Just I a agree. little bit. And it was a little short, too. They could have, yeah. like, that's one thing that they really called me. 85 minutes, it feels like it, we could have had a little more time to expand on some ideas. Yes, I would have liked to have seen, like, them go further back with his uh, his past, but I mean, we, we get the majority of it. Yeah, we get the gist. I mean, I, you know, I just would have, 85 minutes is. Pretty short. They could, have, yeah. they could have given us five extra minutes to round it out to a an scene. hour and a half. Yeah, no. an extra scene or two. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, inspired by our 
new classic this week called Bernie, which we'll tackle uh, in a few minutes. We have our top five for this week, Jack Black Movies. Uh, we, we have yet to do really a, a comedian in the top five. We've done Jodie Foster, we've done Philip Seymour Hoffman, Brad Pitt, but obviously Jack Black known mostly for his comedic chops. Uh, Joe, we're going to start with you, and let's hear your five through two on Jack Black. All right, my number five is Kung Fu Panda. It took me a while to actually get through this movie, but uh, I think one of the things that really interested me about it was the fact that Jack Black was playing this titular heroic character, and in an animated feature film, it just didn't seem like something that jived at the time for me, so I was very skeptical going in about the film. Didn't think I'd like it, but it was actually a pretty good surprise. I thought it was a very good kid's movie. I liked him a lot in it. I thought he just kind of melded very well with the role. I enjoyed the first one. Never saw the second one, though. I've heard mixed things. I didn't like it. I know people that liked it more than the first one. I've heard that. You know, I, I've heard a lot of things. Yeah, I didn't care for it all that much. But I liked the first one. I thought it was a solid film. Number four is Tropic Thunder. I thought he was hilarious in this. I thought everybody was hilarious in this. It was a great comedy. Also another one that I thought looked really dumb, but took me by surprise. My number three is King Kong. Now, hmm. admittedly, it, it once again, another film that I was going in skeptically, but Jack Black's performance is one of the things that really held it up for me. I really liked his character in this film, and I actually enjoyed it. I don't think it's great, but I think it is very, very good, very entertaining. My number two is High Fidelity. I think this is probably one of Jack Black's best performances. He's kind of fitting in as his typical role as the supporting character, but really stands out. It's a great movie. Probably John Cusack's best, you know. I would agree. And I think that Jack Black was a crucial element to that. And it's kind of one of the ways that we subtly see his strong love of music before he kind of got really overblown. And looking back on that, I think it's kind of a great insight into the man as well as his acting ability and the roles that he typically goes for. But that would be my number two. Mm, very true. Justin? Okay. Number five is King Kong. I realize this one often gets criticized for his performance in contrast to the classic performance from the 1933 film, but I think it's really a, a standout performance from Black. And I think one of the best elements of it comes in the very, very end when he delivers the, the classic line, which I won't ruin for anyone who hasn't seen it, but I think it adds further complexity to his character and, and wondering how his character has, uh, has grown or not grown over the course of the film. Number four is School of Rock. We all know that Jack Black loves to play music, as evidenced with uh, Tenacious D, not so much in the film, <laughs> but I thought this was a great and fun performance. The couple songs that he he brings up in the film are incredibly catchy, and I thought his entertaining and, wit and witty banner with the children in the film makes it all the more for a memorable performance. My number three is is a film that we're going to talk about later on the show, Bernie. I thought it was a very against-the-grain performance for Black, and I think it's unquestionably one of his most complicated characters that he's ever portrayed. But I'll leave the rest for the actual review. And my number two, much like Joe, is High Fidelity. Jack Black began playing side characters, and one could argue it's what he does when he's at his best. I think he has many of the movie's funniest moments, and his chemistry with Cusack in the music store is hilarious and relatable. I guess I need to see King Kong, huh? It's decent. It's worth a watch. Um, at School of Rock, I've actually only seen once, so I didn't put it on my list, but Same. I remember very much liking it. I enjoyed it. it. It was like my number six slot until I remembered another movie. Or number five slot, and then I had to push it down. Now it's number six. Oh, nice. Yeah, with Jack Black, it's kind of funny. I knew there would probably only be like eight or nine different candidates for this list, because Jack Black's either got like really good movies... Or, like, Year One, Gulliver's Travels, oh. like, some of the worst oh. Tenacious D movie, like Justin mentioned. Yep. Some of the worst pieces of garbage. It's true. For the last, you know, decade. He's very divisive. It's, like, <laughs> great or horrible. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. definitely one of the more uh, inconsistent actors out there in mm -hmm. terms of uh, films. But my number five is one of his comedies that I think gets overlooked, and that is Orange County. Mm. Uh, I think this movie is not quite on par with, like, American Pie but it came out around the same time, and it's got a this similar feel to it of sort of the slacker, teenage comedy kind of thing. Uh, Catherine O'Hara as his mother is hilarious. She's one of my favorite uh, comedic actresses. Number four, we will be talking about later on the show, and Justin had it in his top five. And that is Bernie. I'll leave that for later. Number three for me is the original Kung Fu Panda. Mm -hmm. I, as well as Joe, really, really enjoyed this performance. 
I actually went into this one with very low expectations as well. I just didn't think... It looked know, dumb. It looked it? dumb, <laughs> and DreamWorks got me twice on that that year because I thought How to Train Your Dragon looked incredibly dumb wow. too, and they both turned out to be really, really good movies. Good news. Uh, number two is Tropic Thunder. <laughs> great movie. Uh, I don't think it's Jack Black's greatest performance. I think he's probably not one of the stronger characters well, in the movie because you've got Robert Downey Jr. who's hilarious. Yeah. Tom Cruise is hilarious as the uh, the agent. <laughs> but for a movie, pretty good. It's it's amazing. I, I mean, it's an it's a great great comedy. Uh, and certainly one of Ben Stiller's best as well. Yes, actually. <laughs> I think. Uh, all right, Joe, what is your number one? Uh, my number one is one we'll be talking about very shortly, and that's Bernie. Oh. That's all I'm going to say. Cool. Can't wait for that. Justin, how about you? Well, my number one is one that has been on both your lists, and that is Kung Fu Panda. Oh, wow. I, uh, Plot m- twist. Much like both of you gentlemen, I, uh, I did not have very high expectations with this. I was honestly... Joking with a couple of my friends in school at the time that we were going to go see this and just make fun of it for the for its ninety minute running time, but I was really surprised. I thought he gave a really funny performance. I thought the action was great. I thought his uh, moments with his supporting cast, like uh, with Seth Rogen, were really really funny. And I'm slightly disappointed that the second one is not as good. I still haven't seen it, but I thought it was just a great film with a great message. And I hope that they can bring it around with part three. Well, again, it depends on who you ask. I mean, I know some people that really liked it more than the first one. I've I'm, heard that the um, villain's better in part two, but I yeah, I, I I doubt you'll like it more because you're you had it at your number one. So <laughs> I, no, I suppose <laughs> not. Um, I, I would like to point out one other Jack Black movie that gets overlooked, uh, sort of in the vein of Orange County, and that's Be Kind Rewind. Oh yeah, that's a very good it's, point. It was it was I went back and forth for that as my number five. I just wanted to toss that out there because if you haven't seen it, it it really is a good movie. I know <laughs> Joe's favorite, Danny Glover's in it. Yes, <laughs> he, <laughs> I, he does seem to be popping up a lot again. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, I do. I, I do think that's a good movie. Uh, I don't think I like it as much as you do, but I think that if you you like the concept of movies, and especially if you're nostalgic for the old VHS days, it'll definitely have a place in your heart. Yeah. All right. Well, my number one is High Fidelity. This is uh, in my top 25 films of all time. We mentioned this at my number one on the very first podcast when we did the movies that reflect our lives. Uh, I've always been sort of... uh, compared to the John Cusack character in the film. And it's the first time I ever saw Jack Black and caught my attention right away. He is hilarious in the film. uh, And just the chemistry between the two of them when they're sort of arguing about their own top five lists and everything is very good. So, yeah, High Fidelity ranks as my favorite. All right, and it's awesome we all put Bernie in our top five. We'll uh, get to that very shortly. A lot of repeats all around. Yeah. Kind well, of, like I said, there's, there's, I kind of figured really, that was yeah, going to happen. There's only so many good Jack Black movies. I never, but never actually saw Orange County. I wanted to. It's pretty funny. Really? It, re- it really is. I've seen it probably three times, I think. It's, it's, it's wow, funny each time. Wow, that's a lot time. for you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, before we do get to our triple feature, which we always uh, close the show with, we do have sort of a special part of our triple feature, and that is uh, something we watch each week before the Oscar A to Z film, and that is a movie serial. We talked about this three, four months ago when we first started watching it, uh, and now we're done. We we finished 15 (laughs) chapters of the 1948 serial just simply titled Superman, and it was uh, the first time we saw Superman in a live-action role, and Joe's going to tell us about that. Mm Mm-hmm. This is a 15-part serial starring Kirk Allen as the Man of Steel in his first on-screen performance as Superman, and also, as Dan mentioned, the first live-action performance of Superman on screen ever. It also has Noelle Neal as Lois Lane. It was directed by Thomas Carr and Spencer Gordon Bennett. What an awesome name. (laughs) After going over the well-known origin of Superman, the plot revolves around the master criminal, the Spider Lady wishes to gain control of the Reducer Ray, a powerful weapon which will allow her to hold the world for ransom. Or something. This (laughs) this serial was originally suggested by Dan to be watched before Oscar Thursdays to get me more pumped up for older films. I think it was a good idea. Thank you. (laughs) Especially with some of the rough ones we've had. It's, It's one ray of hope some nights. Overall, I found the story pretty compelling, and I was impressed by the clever editing and animation used in such, of the old, in such an older series. 
It really captured the feel of the early comics and the 1940s animated episodes, which are classic. Alan is a great Clark Kent and seems perfect for the 40s era Superman. I'm disappointed to hear that he turned down the part for the 50s show because I feel that if he had been given more screen time, he could have done even better things with the character. Perry White and Jimmy Olsen are as enjoyable as ever, and the Spider Lady is a great Golden Age villain, honestly stealing the spotlight from Superman in some episodes. Neil, though playing the part okay I suppose, is written as the most annoying and unlikable version of the character I've ever seen. I know Lois Lane was basically helpless, but I've never actually wanted her to die before. <laughs> Not to mention her terrible taste in hats. This yeah. <laughs> the ser- <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. The serial was hit or miss, as most shows can be, but overall the episodes built up a well-written thriller with some compelling action and mostly good cliffhangers. Still, the series really never beats the origin story of the first episode, leading to a final episode which is a bit clumsy and obviously rushed. Still, it was a fun time, and for that time, it was very well done. If we are grading this serial, I would give it a B+. Very cool. Yeah, I, I gave it a grade, too. So okay, I figured we would. <laughs> we, give, we give everything grades. Our first no. grade for a show. Awesome. That's true. Yeah, this was hugely popular back in the day. Uh, the serial even played weekly in many theaters that had never before booked a serial just due to Superman's likability and popularity when, at the time. When I was looking it up, it seemed it apparently was a big, big financial huge. success. It was big. Huge, yeah, uh, which is why they made the one that follows mm. uh, against the Atom Man. Uh, Kirk Allen is one of the best Supermans that there has been, though his Clark Kent might have needed a little bit of work. I thought his Clark was, yeah. Some cheese is, is to be expected there, though, with the time period. Noelle Neal, who impressively is still alive, also played Lois Lane in the 1950s television series. And as Joe mentioned, Alan was approached to do it, but unfortunately he didn't want to be pigeonholed, so he turned down the role. Neal's Lois is very annoying at times, uh, and shrill, full of herself, but it is the way she was written. It's through little fault of Neal's though she could have definitely lobbied producers to get rid of, as Joe mentioned, the atrocious hat. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, she wears it through the whole series. And it, it disappears. You it disappeared that... a little bit, and you thought, oh, thank goodness. She... And then, and super, then Clark, Clark, Clark Kent brings it back to her. Hey, I found your hat. No. No. <laughs> the worst thing. Um, the animated flying sequences due to the production budget actually turned out to be one of the bright spots. It never got old to see him flying around animated and then going behind a car or a building and emerging as the live-action Superman, even if they did recycle some of the animated sequences, sometimes even in the same episode. The origin story, as Joe mentioned, was fantastic, and once it got into the actual plot of this particular story with the Spider Lady, some episodes were inevitably better than others, but the plot with the discovery of Kryptonite being Superman's weakness was good, Carol Foreman as the Spider Lady was a definite highlight, If this were a full-length feature, it would stretch out over four hours, so there's bound to be a lot of hit-or-miss segments, but overall it was enjoyable, and for my first full-on old-time serial, I as well give it a B+. Justin? This is the second serial I've seen in my lifetime, and I have to say it was the better of the two. Well, Superman's roughly 15-minute adventures have had mixed results, particularly during, as you both mentioned, a rather rushed conclusion. It's always been entertaining looking forward to where it may be heading next. The villainess of the serial brings a great amount of menace and suspense to her character and always making one wonder how she plans on pulling off her sinister plot. She almost balances out Neil's weak and infuriating performance as Lois Lane, who gets progressively unlikable as the story goes on. Unfortunately, due to due to likely budgetary constraints from other things, the film seems to rely heavily on archive footage for later scenes, such as changing or moving during hallway sequences. Overall, the first Superman serial was a fun ride that I would happily recommend to any fan of the character, and I give it a B. And easily available on DVD as well. There's a collection of both of the Superman serials, uh, just called the Theatrical Serials Collection, and I got it at Best Buy, and it's readily available if you are interested in uh, getting it. And yeah, it's funny, some of the episodes were very, like, either useless or drawn out. I, mm-hmm. I wish they would have made that conclusion maybe spread over the last two or three episodes. Yeah, it absolutely. felt like they did cram about two or three episodes into the last one. Because mm-hmm. they were literally like just jumping through plot points. And honestly, Superman has kind of been infamous you know, for being really overpowered. It's one reason why a lot of people don't like him. But for this serial for the time, he was actually very true to his, his character. His powers were great, but not unbelievable. 
And then, of course, we saw him pull off some ridiculous tricks to get the plot moving forward, like sealing a record with his hand movements. <laughs> that was bad. His subtle hand movements because he has such great super strength. Apparently, he's an expert at puzzle <laughs> construction or something. And somehow the record completely worked. It was like, okay, that was just bad. Yeah, guys. that was that was ridiculous. But I really, really enjoyed it, and I could see why these serials were, you know, sort of all the rage before episodic television. Oh, yeah. And I still hope they come back, to be honest with you. I'd watch it again. I, I'm actually yeah. kind of hope we could watch the next one. I'm I'm pumped for that. Yeah, we're going to be starting a new one next week. Haven't quite decided what that's going to be yet, but... See, uh, looks like... Yeah, we've got a Dick few Tracy. choices. A few choices in the mix there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we'll see, and uh, we'll... Give you the update uh, when we're finished that particular serial and uh, give it a good review. Mm -hmm. All right, and now we'll uh, move on to our actual triple feature. And we start off with a new classic, and that's a movie from the last two years. And this one is, as we've all mentioned in our top five, Bernie. Jack Black plays real-life Texan mortician Bernie T-Day, a man that everyone around town loves. And he loves the town as well, especially the family members of the recently deceased. When he befriends recent widow Marjorie Nugent, played by Shirley MacLaine, one of the coldest and most hated people in Carthage, Texas, he becomes not only her friend, but a frequent travel and lunch companion, and it turns into a fairly abusive relationship. In a moment of weakness, Bernie ends up murdering Marjorie and spends the next few months fielding calls from people like her stockbroker and hairdresser and making excuses for where she is. Matthew McConaughey is also in the film as Danny Buck Davidson, the local DA agent against Bernie at his trial. The film Bernie, directed by Richard Linkletter, is one of the best straight-up dark comedies we have seen in quite some time. Known for a wide variety of films, including the Before series, A Scanner Darkly, and School of Rock, Linkletter, who also co-wrote, has assembled a great cast here and pulls from many genres in his playbook. The film is funny, but it also makes Bernie a completely three-dimensional character, and in one of its strongest choices, the film is presented with documentary-type interstitials, a la The Office or Modern Family, with townspeople, many of them real non-actors, giving their two cents on Bernie or Marjorie or the murder. And though these items are mostly scripted, the people put things in their own words, and it achieves a hilarious result. This is one of the films that turned me around on Matthew McConaughey as well, before Magic Mike and Mud, and though his role is small here, he shines in it as he has been lately. It's not Black's best movie for me, as given in my top five earlier, but I would say it's probably his best performance. It's very nuanced, funny, and at times tragic. It might have been nice to get a little more of Marjorie's side of the story, but I'm very happy to give this one an A- upon the second viewing, up from my original B+. It definitely is worth watching a second or even probably third time. Joe, you had this at your number one, so I'm curious to uh, hear what you have to say about Bernie. All right. This is probably Jack Black's best role, and it's shot in a really awesome way. It's sort of a mock documentary slash real documentary combined with dramatic reenactments. It seems to bring up some rather interesting ideas, and though it seems like it really shouldn't be, it remains funny and interesting all the way through. This has to do with great writing, direction, and performances from Black, McLean, and McConaughey. I really wanted more Bernie. It was witty, humorous, and very original. I just really enjoyed it. It's one that I really want to watch again, and I think it's a very valid place in my list. I was very surprised. I'd heard of it, and I was interested in it. I don't know. It's just something about the way this movie was shot. The humor really worked for me, mm -hmm. and I thought it really brought up a really interesting situation that it seemed... Like, one of those elements in life that's just so unbelievable, but you could totally believe it happened. It, just, it was kind of surreal, and I, I just really liked that. And when I, when I found out this was a real true story, like, with real elements, I was like, that's just amazing. And finding out how Jack Black had to interview the actual guy to get his perspective mm. on the role, I mean... Who is still in prison, Who's still in prison, which I, I think even amongst us, after we watched it, sparked some debate. And I think it really gets people thinking, and that's... Something that's really awesome. I think that's definitely something that stands out from a good film with a good director. You said Linklater. He did. What are the other ones you oh, mentioned? Uh, uh, the ones I mentioned were Scanner Darkly, The Before Series, and School of Rock. But he's also done Dazed and Confused. I mean, he's done a lot of movies. The man's got a lot of range. I mean, yeah. I know that Justin loves The Before movies. And, I mm -hmm. mean, he did Scanner Darkly, which is something very different. Completely which Completely different from a, anything else. A movie I really like. Mm -hmm. And uh, School of Rock's also a good one, too. So, I mean, the guy's got range and... 
this is a really good movie. I thought, it, and I mean, the writing was good, the directing was good. I I really enjoyed this one. And your grade? It is an A minus. Nice. Yeah, I, I thought it was super interesting that the townspeople mostly rally behind Bernie, even after admitting, yes, I murdered this woman. They were like, eh, it's all There's right. There's no way it's, he did this. It's, it's something that I feel like if it wasn't a true story, you wouldn't believe you would it. You'd just be like, well, that's ridiculous. Nobody would, would feel that way. And that's the hook. And yet, he, and that's the hook. It, it's just like, there's no way this could happen, but the fact that it's real people give, giving their right. two cents on it, it's like, wow, this <laughs> it really was did. the mentality. And he really does seem like the nicest guy ever who just snapped. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's just an interesting, interesting scenario that that's one thing that makes it really unique. You don't see anything like that in film. Like, Absolutely. It's just, just, it's so unique. It's very rare. Justin, what'd you think of Bernie? I really have to give credit for roles that take an actor completely out of their element and have it work. Director Richard Linklater did just that with the dark comedy Bernie by having Black portray a character so likable that the audience truly feels horrible for everything that will inevitably go wrong. However, whether or not this is Linklater manipulating the character to the audience, much like my argument with Fruitvale Station, could be called into question. The strangest and yet most compelling aspect of Bernie is that it functions so much better when it's not necessarily a comedy, but rather a documentary. As uh, Dan mentioned, Link later sprinkles commentary from actual townspeople who knew Bernie throughout the film, and their comments are outrageously hilarious, mm -hmm. but also insightful into the real-life version of the character, causing one to wonder if it would have been better going that route instead of losing some of its momentum once we get to the courtroom. That said, Bernie is an odd yet entertaining and funny film that I can happily recommend, and I give it a B. That awkward pause. I think it's a bit low, but, you it's, know. I think it's a little low, honestly. I mean, I guess it, it did kind of juggle some pacing issues a little bit, but I thought it was hilarious. The courtroom scenes weren't really that long, though. I mean, it I was really used, only maybe the last I could have used more ten minutes of, of the that. movie. I, I mean, thought they could have expanded on that a little bit. You didn't like those, though, Justin. No, it wasn't that they were bad. It was just... You were kind of engaged in, in terms of like the comedy in like the first and second act, and then once we get to like okay, this horrible thing has happened. He's just sort of like playing it off. It loses some of that comedic flair that it had to start it off. It's yeah. not bad. It just takes a bit more of a well, less comedic, more that's kind of a thing about uh, kind of dark aspects. comedies though. Is that sometimes they kind of leave being funny and just kind of get dark. It just happens a lot, which, which is why I respect and also fear dark comedies because. If you don't do it right, it basically becomes a thriller, and, and you don't want that. You want to keep that comedic tone. I think it was quirky enough that it seemed kind of oddly funny. Well, and some of the townspeople came to the courthouse to either protest or were in the courtroom, so I think that added a little bit of the humor it into it. It was humor throughout pretty much the whole movie, I felt. Was there anything else that you really didn't like that much about it? I mean, you did put it in your top five. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's, it's still a great performance from Black, and like I mentioned in my review, I think... It could be a little manipulative in terms of how Bernie's being portrayed. I mean, obviously, yeah. they could have been playing him off as more uh, possibly him being gay, which isn't bad. It's just was he, wasn't he, or was they, or were they just playing, trying to play an angle? I don't think that was really an important element, though. That was just a little. It, it wasn't. It was side. just. It was just uh, the way they were. We're just people handling. talking about hearsay, like, "Oh, we think he's like this," but it doesn't really matter. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like how people have this complete mindset of, "Okay, nah, you know, he." He's not gay. That that dog don't hunt. He doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't murder people. Oh, that dog don't hunt. You know, like mean, they have this set view of him in a certain well, way. Well, I think it wasn't that mysterious that they. It was like the elephant in the room. They discussed it in the movie, like Joe said, with the the various townspeople. And from what I've read about the story, it's a fairly accurate portrayal. I mean, he was a rather effeminate man that. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah, I mean, you know, it doesn't, whatever. You know. I don't know if they're trying to manipulate the audience into getting a particular perspective on the character that... Well, I think most, I would say most movies want you to get a particular... Fruitvale Station was a little bit of Yeah, too. I mean... No, that, that was, I have been set in, in the review for that as well. Yeah, but you gave that you know, one an A. I gave that an A because it was a lot more hard-hitting. Well, it's also a drama. Well, this one was kind of a dark comedy. Those are... Two different things. Yeah. And, you know, well, it's a little apples and oranges. A little, a little bit. I guess that's that stands to the my 
my issue that Justin mentioned earlier, if, if it's a comedy, up at, up at a letter grade <laughs> when Justin's reviewing it and you'll have the uh, appropriate grade. Sounds accurate this time. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know... <laughs> Because it is comparing apples to oranges. Freeville it, they're, Station, they're obviously, different. is a hard-hitting drama, but it's funny, and this is a dark comedy. They are still based on true stories, kind yeah. of trying to get a certain perspective, yeah. fairly semi-realistic, mm-hmm. you know, like... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, like I mentioned, I didn't hate it, I just, I just think it has a couple flaws. If you're a fan of dark comedies of any sort, yeah, I, I think it's, it's one to watch for sure. All right, well, our old classic this week is Sideways, and that was brought to us by Joe, so we're going to let him uh, take the lead on that one. All right. Sideways is a 2004 comedy-slash-drama film by Alexander Payne, who we all love. It stars Paul Giamatti as Miles Raymond, a struggling writer-slash-school teacher and a wine enthusiast with depression and near-alcoholism issues, and Thomas Hayden Church as his best friend Jack Cole. The film follows their week-long road trip through Santa Barbara wine country and their encounters with Maya, played by Virginia Madsen, and Stephanie, played by Sandra Oh, local women the two men become romantically involved with. The story deals with both men going through a midlife crisis of sorts as Miles struggles with relationships after his divorce and Jack wants to find one last fling due to a fear of commitment. The movie is driven by an honest and rather realistic story that is held together by dramatic weight and smart humor, nailed into place by great performances by all the cast members. Giamatti gives one of his best performances and Thomas Hayden Church also gives one of his best. The two have some of the best chemistry I've seen and are one of the best duos in film in my opinion. I liked them together so much, in fact, that I wish we could see them together in more films. I'd love to see these two characters again, but I'd take other roles as well. Virginia Madsen is great in this as well, and Sandra Oh gives her best film performance, despite the relatively small role. The story is well told, though admittedly does have a depressing tone at points, but it never really becomes tiresome. It's a very good movie that I don't really have any real issues with. I give it an A. Hmm, nice. Justin, what do you think? Sideways is often a uh, split film amongst people, and while I agree that it's a mixed bag, I do have to say it's significantly better than than some of the best work from other directors. While Paul Giamatti and Thomas Hayden Church may very well be one of the most unexpectedly entertaining buddy parodies in cinematic history, the episodic nature of their adventures is a little less so. Some of the aspects of what made Payne's later work so great, such as learning exposition of lesser characters through others in unique and clever ways, is often made a bit more explicit this time around, and it's kind of shame given, as I mentioned, how well it's worked in others. That said, much of the dialogue is both funny and believable, and the resolution truly shows how far these characters have developed from the start to the finish of the film. Like Wine, Payne's work is an acquired taste, but fans of the director's films will not be disappointed here, and I give it a B+. All right. We have talked at length on this podcast about Alexander Payne reviewing almost all of his films over the short seven months we've been doing the show, most recently just a couple weeks ago with current Best Picture nominee Nebraska. So it feels like treading on old ground to say how atmosphere and the character development drive all of Payne's films, but those things are no less true for Sideways. It is a great midlife crisis comedy, and like Justin, I will make a wine reference as well, it is one that gets better with age. Oh. And that age is the viewer's. When I first saw it, I was only about 30, and though I'm still a bit off from where Miles and Jack find themselves, I found myself relating to the story a little bit more than I did in my first viewing. Sandra Oh gives probably her best performance here as Stephanie, Jack's love interest, and Virginia Madsen, who was nominated for a Best Supporting Actress Oscar, is great as well. Payne and Jim Taylor won the Oscar for Best Adapted Screenplay, and it's based on a uh, Rex Pickett novel, who I'm unfamiliar with, but... Apparently it came out the same year as the movie, so pretty quick turnaround. But much like Payne's direction, it goes without saying that Giamatti and Hayden Church are also phenomenal, the latter also earning a nomination. And I agree with with Joe when he says that I would love to see these characters again. And you both hit on their great chemistry with each other, and I I agree completely. It's It's a great buddy pairing. And they're always there for each other as these characters like only best friends would be. I don't think it's quite as funny as it thinks it is. And again, maybe give it another 10 years, I'll find the comedy even more rich. It isn't Payne's best or even maybe in the top three, but even a second tier Payne film deserves an A-. minus. Wow. That's very good. Favorite Payne? Probably About Schmidt for you, right? Oh, About Schmidt is my favorite. Sideways is probably my second favorite. I'm trying to think of why I didn't give it an A+. 
maybe has something to do with the episodic nature that Justin mentioned. I think it's just that, once again, I felt like, especially viewing it this time, as long as it was, I still felt like we could have had a few more scenes. You don't feel the length of this movie you, at all. It's really well paced. It's really well fleshed out. And uh, Okay, I think I know what it is. For me, the funniest part of the movie peaks when there's an antic in like the third act that's just really out there. It's silly when they have to go to a certain location to get something back that was lost. Mm-hmm. I think that's really funny. And I wish the movie had a little more of that and just a little more time with these characters just to kind of solidify where they are. Because we do get that, but could have expanded a little more and... Maybe that's why I feel like it's not quite perfect for me, but mm-hmm. it's pretty darn close. They do have some good development, though. They do. In, in a week's time. For a week, they do go through a lot of development. I think that it was subtle, mm-hmm. actually, but I could have used a few more scenes. And speaking of which, I, I don't know if we've talked about this with Payne films in the past, but his films do all tend to take place over a very short period of time. And Nebraska also, did. The Descendants was only a week, I believe, as well. About Schmidt, a couple of weeks, maybe. He also Isn't like trips. election a month. Uh, yeah, election's probably the longest, um, but that was one of his first as well. So right. he's probably still finding that footage. But even even then, not really. I mean, it's a school election. It's probably only maybe two or three weeks. Mm. And then it fast forwards. And then it fast forwards at the end. It's true. He also likes journeys. He likes, yeah. yeah, he loves loves to have people go on the journey. Likes people to go move. He likes time. He's, yeah. Hey, that's just kind of his trope, I guess. Yeah. Well, it works for him. It does. Yeah. You know? And it ain't broke. Yeah. Don't <laughs> that's fix right. It. That's right. All right. Well, finally, this week we have our Oscar A to Z film, and that is Algiers. This is a 1938 movie that garnered four nominations, Best Actor for Charles Boyer and Supporting Actor for Gene Lockhart, plus two artistic awards, and those were Art Direction and and cinematography. And Justin's going to tell us about Algiers. Pepe Lamoco, played by Charles Boyer, is a French jewel thief who has been living off his wealth in Casbah for two years. However, when he meets a visitor named Gabby, played by Hedy Lamar, who reminds him of his home, Pepe starts contemplating an escape from his self-described prison before the, before the authorities can get a hold of him. Algiers plays around with a with many a cinematic style in its slightly over an hour and a half runtime, and while all are exciting, it does throw the overall tone off. The film skirts around with being a dark noir, a gangster film, and also a love story, sort of like an earlier version of Casablanca. All these are done relatively well, particularly with the cinematography and lighting, but it does feel slightly confusing and awkward when the audience is watching a man get get murdered in a relatively sinister way, and moments later seeing a tender moment between Boyer and Lamar. The overall narrative can get muddled from time to time, and as a result of this, in terms of understanding what exactly is going on, but it still manages to hold interest. However, by the ending, Algiers manages to pull together a great, suspenseful conclusion to its story that makes it well worth a viewing. It's not without its flaws, but the good far outweighs the bad on this one, and I give it a B. Joe, what did you think of Algiers? Algiers. I really enjoyed the dark and somber atmosphere, and I felt that the use of shadows and close quarter shooting complemented the darker nature of the picture. The protagonist was a very interesting and complex character, and I thought that the lead actor, Boyer, played him excellently. I was also thought felt it was very ahead of its time dealing with issues like abuse, culture shock, and nostalgia, not to mention some rather memorable performances from a lot of the supporting actors to make some really memorable standout characters. Still, though the film sets the stage well and builds some intrigue, it kind of loses some of its steam due to some pacing issues and strange editing choices, though that might have been because the film we watched wasn't very well preserved. I'm not 100% sure on that. It does hold up pretty well, though, and I would be interested in seeing other films based on this character if there are any out there. I believe it was a remake, right, Justin? It was. And I would also give it a B. Nice. Um, You guys both hit on a lot of the the things uh, that I felt about the movie as well. Certainly the frenetic nature of going from the different genres. At one point they even break out into a musical number. It's 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 sort of all over the place and that's mm. its biggest downfall. This movie gave Hedy Lamar her sex symbol status throughout the nineteen forties, and though her dialogue here is a little corny by today's standards, she was clearly an on screen beauty. 
And even though she stopped making films by the late 50s, her legacy is long-lasting, inspiring Mel Brooks to name a character after her in Blazing Saddles, and even Anne Hathaway has said that her version of Catwoman from The Dark Knight Rises was based on Lamar. Oh, there it is. The film itself also has wide-reaching cultural impact, not really indicated by its completely forgotten status. As Joe mentioned, it hasn't even really been restored. For one thing, it was the inspiration for Casablanca, of which the Warner Brothers tried to have Hedy Lamar star, but MGM would not release her from contract. And Warners also used Boye's character, Pepe Lamoco, as a template for their cartoon skunk, Pepe Le Pew. The film itself, forgotten as it's been, has never been restored, like we mentioned, so it's one of the worst-looking films that we've watched for the show, and it really is a shame, because there's certainly worse films that we've seen out there, um, and other than its frenetic nature and, you know, some of the corniness and stuff, it really did cover a lot of good ground. And I, like you gentlemen, also give Algiers a B. Hmm. And uh, we watched it from Amazon Instant, so it is available readily on there pretty cheaply, too. One of the cheaper films on there. So, mm-hmm. All right, well, that is going to wrap it up for the show this week. Uh, like I said earlier, coming up... Between now and our next full-on podcast, we're going to have an Oscars mini-sode featuring a collaborator to the show, Tim, and we're going to go over our top 20 best of the year once again, sort of introduce uh, some of the ones that we've seen in the new year that uh, would have came out in 2013. And Joe, anything new uh, with your various pages? You have so much going on uh, lately. Yeah, I've been trying to keep up with it a little bit. The full-on RoboCop review, you mentioned that. Yeah, if you want to check it out, I did like a half an hour <laughs> rant. <laughs> if if you like this rant here, his two-minute rant, like, listen to the whole half hour. It's find, great. If you find Rage entertaining, <laughs> I have heard it's it's been pretty entertaining for people. So mm-hmm. yeah, check that out. Justin and I, of course, have our first There Goes Tokyo on there. There might be some more Yu-Gi-Oh! watching up and hopefully some more anime analysis uh, within the next week. Very cool. And as always, you can check out our five-word reviews weekly on the Film Fanatics website uh, or the Film Fanatics Facebook group, which is Film Fanatics with an exclamation point. You can, of course, join that group as well. Uh, our Twitter account is at a Film Fanatics Pod, and we'll let you know whenever we have a new show up that way. And, of course, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. All right, well, that is going to do it. We'll see you back here uh, soon enough for the Oscars mini-sode and then a full episode next week. Bye!